Hey, good morning. Um, it's good to be with you guys again. I'll have to, you'll have to listen really fast because the guy who was before me talked really long. Well, that was me, actually. So, no. Um, so, um, February of this year, uh, February 6th of this year, there were two massive quakes that struck the southeastern part of the country of Turkey and also northern Syria. Thank you, Ross. And um, the, uh, I had a chance to, to go over to, to help to try to set up some kitchens to investigate what was going on, to try to establish some places to render aid to people after the quakes. I was there a couple weeks after things happened, and the, the devastation was just mind-boggling. My pictures here are, are bad and don't really convey the, the, the breadth of things. You could drive, and we did, we drove for over a thousand miles, but you could drive for a hundred miles in any direction and still find flattened homes and even flattened towns, cities of a million and a half people that were almost abandoned. The beautiful ancient city of, of Antioch, the first place, in, place where people were called Christians in, in southern Turkey, um, was almost completely destroyed by these, these terrible earthquakes, 7.7, then a rapidly followed, or 7.8 and then a 7.7 earthquake, which are just massive. And it was horrible to see the destruction. But the, um, the, an even sadder thing, I don't know where it rates on the sadness scale, but it, it was to talk with people and to hear from person after person uh, that this didn't need to be nearly so bad. 60,000 lives, over 60,000 lives were lost in this destruction, and it didn't need to be that bad. The, Turkey, my wife and I lived there for a number of years, and while we were there in the early 2000s, late 90s, there were several major quakes that killed lots and lots of people, and so they rewrote all the, the building codes and legislation to the standards that they have in Japan and California. They rewrote the codes to say, this here's where you can build, here's how you must build, these are the materials you have to use, these are best practices to keep people safe and alive. And so they passed these laws, they passed these building codes, they were on the books, but that's where they stayed, by and large. Many, many people told tales of government officials and, and even um, rules being passed that if you paid, uh, you paid some fees beforehand, you could skirt the building codes. Now, that may sound a lot like a bribe, because it is, but it was official. You know, you could, you could do this, and I'm not here to, to criticize the Turkish government, because all of our hearts are inclined to, to skirt the rules whenever they don't meet our needs, to, to figure out, well, that's red tape. You know, red tape is, uh, is red tape and very, very inconvenient when it's in the way, um, but a little bit of that red tape would have saved thousands upon thousands of, of lives. So we come today to a, a parable of Jesus that has a really similar tone to it. Um, and it's in the, in the Gospel of Matthew. It comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to turn with me to, uh, to Matthew 7, um, verses 24 to 29, that the, this idea that whenever rules get in the way of our convenience or we, we maybe don't believe that they're necessary for us, we don't believe that they apply to us, we maybe doubt the source, the credibility of the source who passed the rules. Maybe it's been too long since something happened to remind us that really there are such a thing as storms or earthquakes or difficulties that, that will hit life, so we just skirt the rules. So Jesus tells this wonderful, wonderful parable that as I read it more and more, it went from a little kid's song to a terrifying warning in, in my world. So this is, um, the, yeah, so just let me read it for you. It says, therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law, their teachers of the law. So this is a parable by Jesus. Now parables are these stories that, uh, that Jesus used very, very frequently. They're used throughout the Old Testament, other times in the New Testament, to take a truth 
a, a large truth and to make it memorable and transportable so you could communicate it to others. You could uh, bring it along with you wherever you went. So parables were something to, to distill and convey a truth. And here, Jesus has given his longest ever sermon, the, the Sermon on the Mount, his longest disposition. And I would say without argument, though, people might want to argue the greatest teaching ever given in life, the, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, if, if you don't think it was all that important, if maybe you don't even know, you, it's, it's, language has worked its way into the English language, into the Western mind. We think of phrases like, go the extra mile. Uh, that's from the Sermon on the Mount. To um, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Uh, hey, don't judge. I remember as a, as a kid, someone, judge not, lest ye be judged. The lady saying to me, I had no idea what she meant. It's her King James Version, but that's from the Sermon on the Mount. There's just phrase after phrase, concept after concept, idea after idea pulled from the Sermon on the Mount that have worked their way into the warp and the wolf of our language and our culture. And this beautiful, beautiful exposition of Jesus about how it will look how to live in the kingdom, how to love other people, how to treat other people, how to relate to your money, how to relate to God, how to relate to prayer, where to build your life, where to build your foundation. Jesus says, now, if you go away from what I've said here, if you go away from, and I don't have time to preach the entire Sermon on the Mount, unfortunately. So uh, go and read it for yourself. Matthew 5 to 7 is fantastic, fantastic. But suffice it to say, this is what Jesus was pointing to when he says these words of mine. If you don't do them, you are a blathering idiot. You are a fool because you are going to fail and fail catastroph catastrophically in life. Now that might sound like an awfully bold claim, and it is, it is, but Jesus backs it up with a lifetime of service and then ended up on a cross and in a resurrected uh, state. So we're going to look, we're going to break this apart, but uh, three things, I'm going to break the, the message down into three things. A stern warning, Jesus offers a stern, stern warning. A bold claim. He makes a bold claim about himself. And then finally, a gracious invitation. A gracious invitation. So as we launch off into that, let me pray. Father, um, as, as Karen said, we want to we want to look at your word. Don't just hear from me and my, my babblings. We want to hear from you. Speak through us. Through, speak through me. Through the, the songs we've sung have already represented you well. The, the solid rock. The firm foundation. The, the king of kings. We, we want to glorify you and honor you today. We want to hear from you. We don't want it to be just hearers of the word, but doers. We don't want to just look at your word and look into the mirror and then walk away and not do a darn thing about what our faces look like. We want to respond. Holy Spirit, be with us today. Help us to put into practice the things that we, that we hear, make our hearts soft, make our minds open. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so a stern warning, a bold claim, and a gracious invitation. As we look at this passage, I just want to pull out some words for you that, that struck me. Jesus said, anyone who hears my words, anyone who hears my words. Now, hearing, hearing is really easy, right? It's pretty passive. You know, you can hear um, just by sitting there. You can almost... You can't not hear, right? It, it takes a ton of work. Have you ever been distracted by hearing something that you didn't want to hear? Sitting at a coffee shop, you're trying to, to work on something, or you're at home, or you're trying to sleep, and you hear. So at, at one level, hearing is the most passive thing we do, right? It's just uh, constantly bombarded by noise, the, you know, eardrums, the little bones, the bili, all that stuff's responding whether you want it or not. However, Jesus isn't talking about that. Everybody hears. Everybody, he's sitting on... Given this sermon, his, it says the, the crowds are listening, his disciples are listening, everybody's hearing it. But he says, if you hear, if you just hear and don't do anything with it, there are terrible, terrible consequences. And we live in an age that it's so easy to hear so much. You can't, I, I, day after day, we're just bombarded by information that we do nothing about, right? That... This is getting warmer, and there's a war here, and trafficking is happening here, and there, there's just tons of information coming into our world and our hearts and our minds that we feel like we could do nothing about, and we're paralyzed by this information overload, this distance between our ability to act and our ability to know and to learn, and just 
flooded, flooded, flooded with information. And Jesus says, but when you come to my words, it can't be treated like that. These words cannot be treated like just information. Jesus isn't talking as by just like some philosopher or some sage or some college professor that you lost the notes to long, long ago that you said, check, I went to the class because the guy wasn't jerk enough to make me do, like, why would you take attendance? This is college, you know? But he did it anyhow, but you went and you made sure I'm hearing, but I'm not listening. So, but he says, hearing. Hearing is something that we all take part of. But, and he says, these words of mine. When he gets to these words of mine, so again, referring to the Sermon on the Mount, and here he addresses almost everything you consider in life your deepest love, your deepest passion, why you're alive what you'll do with your finances, with your heart, with your relationships, with your marriage, uh, your anger, your heart. Jesus says, these words of mine, I'm going to address every single area of your life. And unless you put them into practice, you got a problem. You got a problem. Now, it could be um, when, when we say put into practice, there are two, two ways of talking about obedience, okay? I say, okay, I want you to move that rock from here to here. And it's, it's a one or a zero. You did it or you didn't, right? The rock moved or it didn't move. Here, I think the sense is a lot more like if I tell one of my kids, when, when, you know, one of my sons is 12 years old, and I'm like, hey, buddy, um, they're not anymore. They're older, as am I. Um, so I want you to go cut the grass. Go cut the grass. They're like, okay, I'll go cut the grass. Off he goes to cut the grass, heads out, can't get the mower started. You know, he put on his shoes, um, open the garage door, push the mower out there, pulls, 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 nothing. Has he obeyed? Yeah. You know, he started to put into practice what I say. So um, I don't want to explain away or let us off the hook too early from the, from the Sermon on the Mount or for the teachings of Jesus. But uh, when you, if you are hearing perfect obedience is the standard for your life, um, then, then maybe you'll start shutting down. But Within the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus frequently mentions the idea of forgiveness. Even in the Lord's Prayer, which is found there, he says, um, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sit against us. Hey, he says, for, if you know, if you're there, you take your, 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 your offering to the altar and you realize someone has something against you, go and ask forgiveness of that person. So he knows we need forgiveness, right? Don't, don't start fishing around in someone else's eye to get a speck out when you have a log sticking out of yours. He knows we need Forgiveness. So that's, that's a given, okay? That's a given that we need forgiveness. He's not talking about perfect obedience. But if you don't get up, start putting on your shoes, opening the garage door, and start pulling, um, if there's not some aspect of response, then you're not putting it into practice. So, so moving on. He says, put it into practice. A quote that I, I read from a, a Jewish scholar when it came to the Sermon on the Mount, he says, in, the his, in fact, the history of the Sermon on the Mount can largely be described in terms of an attempt to domesticate everything in it that is shocking, demanding, and uncompromising and render it harmless. So often, uh, I, again, I can't preach the whole Sermon on the Mount, but as you read it, we're, and, and many of the words of Jesus, we, we, we want to say, well... We believe, and I'm talking uh, to, to, to those who are followers of Christ. If you're not a Christ follower, and you're, um, then you're under no obligation to follow the words of Jesus, okay? You're just under no obligation. He's just a guy in history. I encourage you to check him out. He's fantastic. He's wonderful. He's the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, gave you life, gives you breath every day. But if, if that's not where you're coming from, then um, start the process of getting to know him. But if you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, I believe he was who he said he was, he, who he claimed to be, then his words must be taken seriously. But so frequently, we begin to domesticate his words and say he couldn't have really meant that because that's crazy talk. You know, you can't turn the other cheek when someone slaps you. You can't, uh, someone ask you to go one mile, go two, that, that you can't give without expectation of return. That'll, I'll be broke. Like, what sort of life is that? He says, that's a kingdom life. That's a kingdom life. And that's the life I'm, I'm commending to you and commanding of you. So, so going through here, he says, whoever hears my words, these words of mine, puts them into practice, is wise. So he contrasts a, a wise person, someone who puts his words into practice, and a foolish person, someone who doesn't put his words into practice. So wisdom in the, in the scriptures, in the Bible, it has both a moral component but an intellectual component. So you're both dumb 
and you're, you're morally bent whenever you don't do something that's wise. So Jesus categorizes the person who, who follows his words, who says, yes, I'll do what you want, what you say, or at least attempt to put into practice what you say as wise. The other person is a fool, as a fool, someone who's morally bent the wrong way and not very bright. Now, it has nothing to do with your IQ score or whatever. I've known a lot of very, very, very wise people who are very simple. They're not uh, brilliant folks. However, uh, on the other hand, known a lot of people who are just absolutely brilliant um, who are, are fools. And I, I, I don't know that I'm brilliant, but I can be an awful fool at, at times as well. But he says that the, the, the wise person puts his words into practice. The fool hears. They both hear. They both begin to build, but the fool doesn't put Jesus' word into practice. Um, he contrasts rock and sand. Now, as I thought about this, I just, um, there's the idea of rock. I don't know if anybody here, well, if you've ever dug a ditch, ever been digging a ditch or, or working and hit a rock, it changes how you work, right? What went from a, like a, 20 minute, one hour maybe project went to a long, long project and maybe more tools, maybe power tools, which they didn't have the option back then. Sand, on the other hand, is very accommodating, right? Rock, you have to bend your life around. Rock, you have to accommodate. Rock is, is unforgiving. Uh, sand is, is wonderful. It's immensely malleable. You can make castles out of it. Some of us are coming back from beach vacations, and you can make all kinds of cool stuff out of it. It can seem really, really hard. I remember running on the beach one time and getting shin splints from just the impact on the sand because it felt so, so hard. But in a moment, it can change shape. It can go all away. It can be washed away in no time. So Jesus says, those of you who build on, who respond to my commands by doing what I say, you're building your life on, on rock, on a solid foundation. You will bend your will to accommodate mine. You'll hear, I want you to go this way. But you're like, yeah, but I want to go this way. And you say, okay. I didn't want to go cut the grass. I want to play video games. I wanted to, you know, go hang out with my friends. But I'll do what you want. You start to bend your will to his. Sand, on the other hand, when Jesus gives commands about your money, about your sex life, about um, where you find your absolute foundation for, for who you are, you say, well... Jesus says, go this way. However, I'd rather do it this way. I, let me, how do I accommodate Jesus' commands? How do I explain his commands? How do I massage his commands to fit what I want? That's essentially where you're building a foundation. And Jesus says that is a, that he just issues a stern warning and says that will end up in a crashed mess, a heap that will leave you wanting, that there will be nothing left of it. And when we get to that, there's both the... Um, the storms that are coming, the storms that are coming, that, you know, when you read this passage, you read commentaries on it, and, and people are, some folks think it's the storms of life. Some folks think that it, it, most people say it's, the, it, it's eternally when we stand before God in judgment. When we stand before God and he says, what did you build your life on? And, and Paul refers to this later. He says that some build on wood, hay, and stubble, and some build on, on a firm foundation. That, and, and I think it's kind of both or at least the storms of this life are a precursor to the storm that will come, kind of a, a test, and we'll, we'll look at that. So um, Jesus says storms will come, and this, this, these storms that will come, they're coming for everybody. Jesus isn't giving advice about where to build your life. When he says build your life on, on the rock by obeying my word, he's not saying, and then you will avoid the storms. If, if you simply do what I say, storms won't come into your life. Difficulty won't happen in your life. You won't have rain and flood and rising waters. They're coming. They're coming. Most of us have had them in one form or fashion, in many forms and fashions. So they're coming regardless of where you build. He's simply saying and profoundly saying that where you build determines how it's going to end up. Is this a very good, you know, the storms just passed and it was wonderful to see um, the palm trees bending or that your home was completely washed away. So as I was thinking about this, and, and I, I admit, I threw this in at the last second, but I, I have to. The, um, whenever we get to who, um, who is Jesus, the reason that what occurred to me as I was thinking about this and thinking about the, you can add these two things together. So hearing and then the source, hearing plus the source equals our response, right? If you, you hear something, you hear, okay, um, I don't know, the stock market is going to crash tomorrow, and you hear it from me, don't give it a second thought. I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. 
don't obey, don't sell anything, don't make any, different, don't make any changes in your life or your portfolio, please, okay? So if you hear the same thing from the chairman of the Fed, um, you hear the same thing from, you know, a Nobel Prize winning economist, and, you know, you, you begin to think, okay, I probably ought to act on that. Well, the reason that it's, the, this foundation is so important is because of the second thing it reveals about our hearts is Jesus makes a bold, bold claim. He makes a bold, bold claim to his own identity. The, the, our response to Jesus' teaching reveal who, reveals who we think he is. And that's the foundation of life. Your response to Jesus, my response to Jesus, who we think he is, is the most important thing. It's the thing that will turn, will determine this, how we weather the storms of this life and how we weather eternity. Where we will spend eternity in relation to God is how we respond to who Jesus is. If, if he's just a guy, if he was just a, a wonderful, sophistic philosopher who got up and, and gave this lovely teaching, then... If we don't respond to it, it's no big deal. If he was who he claimed to be, if he was who he said he was, if he was the Lord of the universe who came in flesh and blood and lived and died, then, and we don't do what he says, then, then we are fools. We are fools. We're building our lives on shifting sand. So a bold claim. So what are the implications of Jesus' statement here? Someone who would say, my words, my words are the absolute foundation for all of reality is um, the, 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 here's what the people said about him. They said, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of their law. If you know anything the, about the teaching of Jewish um, rabbis, they would, they would build their teaching upon the teaching of others. Maybe they would quote something from the Old Testament, from the Torah, um, and then they would say, well, Rabbi so-and-so says this, Rabbi so-and-so says this, Rabbi so-and-so says this. And they would kind of leave it at that. They had a series of quotes of other people. They would build their, uh, their argument based on what other people said. Jesus got up and said, you have heard it said that uh, you should not murder. Good idea. But I tell you, not only don't murder, but don't hate another person. Don't look at another person with hatred in your heart or you're in danger. He said, you have heard it said. You have heard it said, but I say. You have heard it said, but I say. He takes and makes this bold claim to authority. So that the people, when they heard him, they say, he teaches as one who has authority. Full stop, I'm saying this. And his, uh, so he's, he's claiming this great authority. So first he makes the, the, he gives a stern warning, but there's a bold claim to authority as he goes through here. He says, he goes and he blesses and he curses people. He says, this is blessing. This is true blessing. The blessed life looks like this. The cursed life looks like this. You are blessed if you do this. You are cursed if you do that. Who blesses and curses but God? God looks at the day and says, he blessed the earth and said, go, be fruitful, multiply. He blesses. He pronounces curses. This is how Jesus is. We, we think sometimes that Jesus never really, and there are, there are those who say Jesus never really claimed to be anything other than a good moral teacher. He never claimed to be anything than a good rabbi. Jesus makes the wildest claim, sometimes implicit right in his statements. He said, I am the fulfillment of the law, he says within the, the Sermon on the Mount. I came to fulfill everything in the law. He says his teachings are the rock on which to base your life. The Old Testament refers time after time after time to God as the rock. God is the solid foundation, the rock. And Jesus says, yes, that's absolutely true, and that's me. Nice to meet you. You know, he, he makes himself equal with God through these statements. Now, he doesn't um, always state these things absolutely and clearly so that people can hear them because that will get you killed, right? Which is uh, precisely what happened to Jesus, right? So there's this sense of progressive revelation in the life of Jesus. He unfolds and reveals who he was through his words, through his actions, until people come to the conclusions and says, who is this guy? When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds are amazed because he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. So Jesus would come and people would say, who is this man? Who is this man? Who is this man? And they start to ask this question. And the answer increasingly becomes, he must be the God of the universe who has showed up amongst us. So he makes a bold claim. And it's um, people and their response to this, I said, the response to his teachings, do they obey it or do they disregard it, really reveals who they think he is. And, and lastly, he makes uh, what I think is a, is a gracious invitation, a gracious invitation. I was thinking about this. Is it just a, a warning to people? Is it just a, a, is it, 
we might think it's awfully closed-minded for a guy to come up and say, this is, I am the only one that you should ever, ever listen to. Okay, that sounds a little cultic, it sounds crazy. I'm the only person you should listen to. However, it depends on the context, right? If, um, if there are 20 tunnels in front of you, you know, you're, you're maybe exploring some caves and you have a guide with you and the guide says, this is the way. All the other 19 lead to death. Go this way. You say, you're a very arrogant fellow. How dare you tell me which tunnel to take? I will take whatever tunnel I, my heart pleases. I darn well please. I'm going to tunnel number 16. And you end up trapped and stuck in a little thing. And um, Jesus has the authority to say, he's like, I've been there. You know, I am the God of the universe. I wrote the book of your life. I know how life works if you follow me. This isn't arrogance, it's just reality. I had a, a, a friend from New Zealand who used to say, Dave, reality is our friend. Reality is our friend. I, I would get, you know, torqued as we were working together on something and, you know, be trying to explain away this, that, or maybe we could have, maybe we we're not looking at the data correctly or whatever. He's like, hey, hey, man, reality is our friend. Let's just, you know, embrace reality and then begin to respond. Jesus says, hey, here's the reality. You are, you are stuck and you have two options in life. You, you're stuck at a fork in the road. One is to obey me and experience life and life eternal, to be able to build on the things I say and build your life and trust and hope and this, these, the principles that I teach of how you should relate to other people. The other is mostly, as I looked at all the other, the other foundations, they basically came down to doing what you want to do. Sand. The sand foundations were basically doing what you want to do. Like, um, and the example I used about Turkey just ignoring what's in black and white and saying, but that's not convenient. It would be cheaper to do it this way. It would be more convenient to do it this way. I want to do it this way. And to start to build your life based on essentially what you want to do, what you want your relationships to look like. What you, what's more convenient for you in terms of your job. And it doesn't all have to be bad stuff. It's not just about sex and money and power. Jesus says the things that you place your highest value in, if it's not obedience to me, if it's not with me as the Lord of your life, acknowledging me as your king, it will fail. It will fail you. It will ultimately fail you and end up in a fall with a great crash, as he said. So it's a gracious invitation to us. So a couple of things I, I want to just ask you to consider um, as just kind of diagnostically. So how do you respond when you hit rock in your life? Okay. Now maybe this, what I, specifically, when you are maybe sitting here in church week after week, perhaps year after year, decade after decade, um, and you hear something that doesn't quite fit with what you want to do. Do you ignore it? Do you try to explain it away, try and find a way around it? Or do you say, I need, I need to obey. There's something, I need to change the way I'm, my, my generosity. I need to change, um, and it, it may not be, yeah, it, it might be like the kid pulling the mower again, but do you take a step towards uh, what you're, I need to change what I'm putting into my brain. I need to change uh, how I spend my time. I need to change how I relate to this coworker. I probably need to go across the street and apologize to my neighbor. Boy, I really I, I felt God prompted me to talk with that person, to pray with that person, and I, I refused. And I need to just say, God, I'm sorry. Give me another shot. You know? Do you, when you hit rock, when you hit the rock of God's word, when you hit something that just doesn't accommodate you, do you, do you move your life to accommodate God's word? Do you respond in obedience? Or do you say, no, I would rather it accommodate me, and I ignore over and over. And the terrifying thing here is you can build your life. This house gets built. Both of these houses get built. They look precisely the same, right? He says nothing about the building quality, nothing about what the countertops look like. Um, they both have windows that are really, really nice. You know, the front porch looks awesome. The only time things are revealed is when the storms come. So how do you respond when you hit rock? Uh, second thing I want to, there's a, there's a grace of the storms in your life. Um, thank God for little storms. This, okay, only guy I've ever been jealous of in my life. Nah, that's probably not true, but Troy Polamalu, because uh, he's fantastic. And uh, 
you know, my wife wanted to get a jersey. And I said, what jersey do you want? Troy Polamalu. I'm like, oh, dang it, okay. But um, fantastic guy, football player for the, uh, for the Steelers. And um, he wrote a letter to, to a friend of his, Bryant McFadden, who was, was hurt. And uh, he wrote this letter, and um, he said, man, I envy you. Man, I envy you because you get to trust God in your pain. He said, these, these storms that hit our lives and are difficult for us, they give us opportunities to grow as men. He said, I've just been playing football right now, but you, you are working and you are suffering and it's making you a better man. Man, I envy you. And he meant it. He meant it. It's one of the reasons I'm so jealous of the guy. He's a fantastic athlete and a godly guy. But anyhow, um, that, that the difficulties that come into your life, they, they reveal, they start to reveal the foundation. Now, the analogy, the parable may break down a bit because you can't, it's very, very difficult. You can move a house entirely. Um, but it may reveal that, that some bits of your foundation have been built on sand and that you're not obeying and that, um, oh, wow, I was trusting in what other people thought of me. I was trusting in my work. I was placing all my hope in how my kids turned out or I was, you know, how my 401K or 403B, how these things did. That was where my hope was coming from, and it's going away. You know, God is, I, I say this is a gracious invitation because Jesus didn't have to come. He didn't have to offer us life. We, we hear the, the threat part of it, perhaps, that our lives will end up in a massive heap. But at the beginning, he says, whoever hears my words, listen, I'm talking to you. I came, I, I took on flesh and blood. The incarnation is the most wonderful reality in history, that he came to be near us. He took on flesh and blood so he could talk to us. He could give it, and he, he taught. He sat for hours and days and years and taught people. It's a gracious invitation. It's a gracious invitation to start conforming our life to, the, to that which God um, wants from us. So the grace of little storms in our life that start revealing things. And one, an encouragement that I will give you is something I learned in language learning when I was working on Turkish is learn a little and use it a lot. Learn a little, just use it a lot. If it, it's a small step of obedience, if you're like, I really should be more generous. Okay, I really should be more generous. Okay, maybe you're a giant, and uh, this is maybe a silly analogy, but you see the Children Miracle Network thing comes up. Do you want to round up? Just say yes. Take a step. You know, maybe it's a little one today. You know, um, there's, you get something in the mail, somebody's asking for something, normally just chuck it. Say, I'm going to read that. I'm going to read that and maybe give. You know, or uh, some area, there's something in your life, you're, something you're watching and you feel creepy after you watch it. Well, just maybe quit it. You know, maybe just mention, man, I feel creepy every time I watch that show. Maybe I'm just not going to anymore. Or there are places you go on the Internet and you're like, I'm going to talk with someone about that. So you start to, to make small incremental changes. And you just learn a little, use it a lot. When you hear something from Jesus, when you encounter something in his word, begin to, to practice. Don't, don't, don't figure out how do I get around this? How do I not obey it? How does this not apply to me? There's section three code, you know, paragraph four A says I can get away with it. Don't, don't do that. Say how does this apply to me when you sit here in church? Because it's, it's terrifying that these houses can be built the same as Jesus sat around with his disciples, and there were those who followed, there were those who obeyed, there were those who heard everything he, he said, and their lives ended up in destruction. We think of Judas, but also the crowds who were there. They listened to every single word. He has the grace of hearing the greatest teacher and the greatest sermon in, ever, and they didn't apply it to their lives, and it ended up nothing more than a catastrophe, catastrophe for them. So learn a little, use it a lot. And then by way of encouragement, I want to let you know, you're not alone. You are not alone. Right before this, right before these warnings, Jesus says, ask and seek and knock. And in, in the Luke, the parallel uh, passage to this, Luke, when he, when he refers to this ask, seek, knock, he's talking about asking for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's help. He said, now what father among you, if his son asked him for, for a loaf of bread, would give him a rock? What father among you? If his son asked him for a fish, would hand him a snake. Who would do that? No one. So if you ask for the Holy Spirit, if you ask for God's help, he'll give it. He's much better than, than you guys as dad. So, so God will come alongside and help you. So you're not alone. You're not alone. Ask for God's help. It's not just slavish obedience. It's submission to say, Jesus, I recognize who you are. You're the, the, the living son of God. And you, you, you give me this gracious invitation to follow you. I want to do that. I want to do that. And uh, just like, you know, if, if I went out and started chiding my son for not cutting the grass whenever he's 
pulling away, sweating, pulling away at that mower. You know, what kind of idiot would I be? God's not like that. He's not looking at you and saying, man, I'm, I'm really trying, God. I'm really trying. Repent, ask for forgiveness, the grace of God to fill you, the, the gift of, the, of God's spirit who lives in the heart of every believer that wants to give you life. And then say, Jesus has gone before me. Every command he gave to turn the other cheek, every, to go the extra mile, to lay down his life, to bless those who persecute, he's gone and he's done. He did and he ended up on a cross and raised from the dead so that I could have forgiveness and have life. And by his grace, I'm going to take one step. I'm going to take one step to build my life on the foundation that is the rock. So that's the invitation, the gracious invitation of Jesus for you today. Friends, if, if, if God's moving in your heart, wants you to respond in some little way um, today, I invite you to come up for, for prayer. That doesn't mean you're, you know, you're repenting from some horrible, horrible embezzlement scheme or whatever, but some little way that God wants to move in your heart today to, to call you a little more towards himself that you want to respond. We'll have some folks gathered up here that would love to pray with you, just love to pray with you and try to put into application some of the things we're, we're, we're working on as we go through the parables today. So let me close this in prayer. Father, Father, thank you for the opportunity to, to look at your word today, um, to look a little more closely at the, at the face of Jesus and to hear his gracious words to us. Um, we, we recognize that we can just be like a man who looks in the mirror and, and walks off and, and doesn't, doesn't change. I, I pray that you'd help us to put into application the things that you are calling us to in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, friends.